spring ahead, fall back? Does it even matter? Why do we even bother? Well, hello and welcome to another episode of You and Me and Multiple Sclerosis. My name is Pam and I've been living with multiple sclerosis for almost 38 years. Remember that magazine I referred to in my last video, Brain and Life? It's a free magazine and it's very easy to subscribe to and I'll link to it again in my description. I discussed an article of interest, but there's more than one in this issue actually. There were several. But the one I want to talk about today has to do with a subject that's kind of a sore point for most people, and that is that in the fall we gain an hour and in the spring we lose an hour. And I know all kinds of studies have been done on the productivity losses, especially with the loss of the hour in the spring, and just the general effect on people's moods and mental health. But did you know that according to some neurologists, there is an effect on our actual biology and it might even affect our neurological health. So I'd like to look at that article today and share some of the findings with you and see if it relates to experiences that you have had with springing ahead and falling back. Here's the article again from the current issue of Brain and Life. How does daylight savings time affect health? Well, <laughs> I know it affects my mood, but let's see if there's actually any health effects involved with the changing from standard time to daylight savings time. And the contention here is that changing between standard time and daylight saving time twice a year disrupts more than just sleep. These experts are going to explain which time might be best and why. At the start of the article here, it says that in less than a month on November 6th, most households in the United States will turn their clocks back an hour as part of the twice yearly toggling between daylight saving time and standard time. The ritual of springing forward in March and falling back in November is considered an inconvenience by many Americans, including me. In fact, 64% of them would like to eliminate these biannual disruptions, according to a March 2022 poll by YouGov, an international market research and data analytics company based in the United Kingdom. That may be why the United States Senate thought it was responding to popular opinion when it unanimously approved last March the Sunshine Protection Act of 2021 which would abolish these changes and set clocks permanently to daylight saving time. Next spring, we would spring ahead and then we just would leave it there. Now, it says here, though, that the problem, according to neurologists and sleep specialists, is that our body's natural clocks are out of sync with daylight saving time. It denies us the morning light we need to wake up and delays the cues of darkness that tell us we need to rest, says Logan D. Schneider, MD, a sleep neurologist at the Stanford Sleep Medicine Center in Redwood City, California. Daylight saving time also increases the gap between our biological clocks and our social clocks. Our internal clocks, it says, optimize various bodily functions throughout the 24-hour day, including digestion, hormone secretion, and the sleep-wake cycle. Light is one of the strongest drivers of these internal clocks. Greater exposure to light in the morning and less exposure in the evening support synchronization of our body's function. During standard time, the sun is directly overhead around noon in most places, which best matches our biological sleep-wake cycle. The article goes on to say, reducing exposure to morning light and increasing it during the evening, as happens during daylight saving time, has been shown to cause sleep deprivation, which can trigger inflammation and activation of genes associated with different cancers, said neurologist Beth Ann Mallow, director of the Vanderbilt University Medical Center Division of Sleep Medicine in Nashville. 
In addition, the misalignment of our natural circadian rhythms can contribute to obesity, diabetes, and heart disease. And then they talk about several studies that seem to have borne this out, saying that the shift to daylight saving time was associated with elevated risks of cardiovascular disease, mental and behavioral problems, and immune-related disorders. And they continue on, even slight misalignments between the body clock and the social clock can have serious health consequences. In an article published in Cancer Epidemiology, Biomarkers and Prevention in 2017, researchers found health disparities within time zones. People who live in the westernmost parts of a time zone, where sunrise and sunset occur minutes later, experience more health problems and shorter lives on average than their counterparts who live on the time zone's eastern edge. The authors stated that circadian disruption is a probable human carcinogen. Well, we could just pause there for a minute and consider that there are a couple of states in the United States that do not do this time-shifting thing. They just stick with standard time all year round. It would be interesting to know if anyone's ever done any studies on the people who live in those states and see what their medical histories tend to show. If there's a trend, that would be interesting to know, wouldn't it? Well, they continue on. Based on these studies and other evidence, the American Academy of Sleep Medicine strongly agrees that daylight saving time should be eliminated. In a 2020 position statement, the organization called for the adoption of permanent standard time because it aligns best with human circadian biology and protects the health and safety of Americans. And the statement was endorsed by more than 20 medical, scientific, and civic organizations. But, of course, our government, in its infinite wisdom, seems to have decided to do entirely the opposite. The bill that is before the Congress right now is to make daylight saving time permanent rather than standard time. And then it gives us a little history here of why we even have daylight savings time in the first place. It says that it was first introduced in the United States toward the end of World War I to save energy. Moving an hour of sunlight from morning to evening meant people didn't need to use as much electricity at night. It also went into effect on March 1918 and was repealed six months later after the conflict ended but again, during World War II, Congress approved springing forward, saying the move would save fuel and promote national security and defense as workers could toil later into the evening in support of the war effort, according to the U.S. Department of Defense. The switch was nicknamed Wartime, and time zones were rebranded Eastern Wartime, Pacific Wartime, and so on. I wasn't alive then, so I have no recollection of that for sure. But that federal law was repealed in 1945. But then 30 years later, in December 1973, President Richard Nixon signed a bill launching a two-year trial period of permanent daylight saving time. Before the initiative began, almost 80% of Americans supported the idea of an extra hour of afternoon light according to newspaper reports at that time. What they didn't consider, until it went into effect, is that the extra hour of afternoon light resulted in an additional hour of morning darkness. Some school children left their homes when the sky was jet black and had to carry flashlights, according to a report in the Washington Post. Just weeks into the change, eight children in Florida were killed in traffic accidents linked to sleep-deprived drivers negotiating dark morning roads. The tragedies made national news and prompted the state's governor to ask Congress to cancel the trial. Elected leaders in other states also started having second thoughts. Well, unfortunately, it seems that enough time has passed that even the folks in Florida have forgotten what happened when they tried making daylight savings time permanent that also is going to mean that it won't get light in the morning for an extra hour. And then they go on to say that the idea of a permanent time change would save energy did not prove true. 
in Chicago, a spokesperson for Commonwealth Edison Company said the time change had saved less than one-tenth of one percent in electricity. Much more energy has been saved by, by voluntary conservation. A mother in Texas noted that while she might no longer need to turn her lights on in the afternoon, she was now being forced to turn them on earlier in the morning. And if all the lights are on when my children get ready for school, how much energy is being saved, she asks. But there is still a push to make daylight savings time permanent. And about half of Americans, apparently, support this. And I am beginning to wonder if perhaps the people who support it are not morning people like me, because I love having sunshine in the early hours of the morning. I get up early and I like watching the sun come up. I like having the early morning hours to myself and to enjoy the peace and quiet. So perhaps it's just personal preference or personality or whatever, but it looks to me like I must be in the minority then if there's more of a push to make daylight savings time permanent than to make standard time permanent. Now, according to this article, since 2015, about 30 states have passed legislation that would end the twice yearly clock adjustments and make daylight savings time permanent immediately if Congress votes to change the law, which at this point has not entirely happened. But as Dr. Johnson reminds us, businesses think they will do better with people being out later, and some will do better. But sleep loss and sleep disruption affect the productivity and safety of workers. So on average, people lose about 19 minutes of sleep every night because of the extra hour of daylight during daylight saving time, resulting in a significant loss of productivity, according to a 2019 study in the Journal of Health Economics. So it's interesting how much this has been looked at. But it doesn't really seem like these studies and these experts' testimony has done any good when it comes to what the government decides is the better way to go. And this is the paragraph that's probably of most importance to us with multiple sclerosis. It says, for those with neurologic disorders, the short and long-term impact of permanent daylight saving time will be similarly negative. The underlying brain dysfunction will likely exacerbate the cognitive and memory effects of sleep and circadian rhythm disruption. Dr. Malo says her patients with narcolepsy and autism have told her that daylight saving time intensifies their underlying conditions, but there are no hard data corroborating that. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Studies on the negative effects of daylight saving time have focused on the general population. But the disruption of circadian rhythms could affect people, to, people whose rhythms are already dysfunctional, such as those with Alzheimer's disease or conditions sensitive to circadian patterns such as migraine and epilepsy. A small study in headache in 2018 found a link between circadian misalignment and de delayed sleep and more frequent and severe migraine attacks. So the status of the legislation it's now in the House of Representatives. The law, of course, doesn't apply to Arizona and Hawaii. As I said earlier, they have not done this changeover thing. They stick with standard time year-round since the 1960s. While supporters, it says, had hoped the issue would be settled this year so President Joseph Biden could sign the law and make daylight saving time permanent beginning in November 2023, that now seems unlikely. In late July, Congressman Frank Pallone Jr., who oversees time change policies as chair of the House Committee on Energy and Commerce, told The Hill that the country faces more pressing issues. Well, I wouldn't argue with that. And the debate would be set aside for now. Well, I guess that's always going to be the case because the data is probably not compelling enough either way for them to make this a priority in comparison to inflation, wars overseas, supply chain problems, all the other problems that we are facing as a nation right now. And this is interesting in this paragraph, 
um, that the divide between people who prefer the permanent daylight savings time and those who argue for permanent standard time, they don't fall across partisan lines, but tourism prefers daylight saving time to keep visitors out later, but more rural lawmakers say farm communities prefer standard time. And I'm a country girl, so I guess that's why I prefer standard time. And I'm also a morning person, so that's another reason I prefer standard time. I'd love to know about you. What do you think? And of course, it's unknown what's going to happen. But this is probably not a totally dead issue, because while we don't get an awful lot of complaining about the falling back part, we do get push back on the spring ahead part. Every year we hear how productivity is impacted by having to lose an hour of sleep or an hour of your weekend or whatever. So we will be hearing about this year after year after year. And of course this all got me wondering why a day was 24 hours long to begin with because clocks are an artificial construct and hours are an artificial construct. So who decided all this in the first place? So I found this article on World Atlas. If we scroll down here, we just get the gist of the whole thing. So the first people that started dividing days into 24 parts were the ancient Egyptians. The Egyptians mostly used sundials and water clocks to keep track of time. And the number 24, as it says elsewhere in the article, had to do with the, the different stars that the Egyptians were tracking. One of the things that was interesting was that, yes, they had all these 24 hours, but for the longest time, hours were not of equal length, which is very interesting. I'm not quite sure how they even kept track of all that. But they recognized that there seemed to be more hours of darkness than there were of daylight. And they had to figure out how to make the clocks or the, the sundials reflect that. And so they came up with something that was kind of complicated, really. But they felt that it, it, it took those changes, those seasonal changes into account. But it says here in the third bullet, the person that brought order into everything and introduced the 24-hour day as we know it today was Hipparchus, a Greek astronomer. He used equinoxes and measured 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of nighttime. The equinox has to do with the equator, and it's the part of the year where the daylight hours are the same length as the darkness hours, and that he... He figured that everywhere in the world there were times when that was true, and he calculated all this out, and that's why we have 12, that's why we have 12 hours of daylight, 12 hours of nighttime, 24 hours, and they are of equal length. But I'm butchering that explanation, I think, so I'm going to link this article down below. You can read more about it. And maybe you're not even that interested in this whole thing, but I always wonder how things like this even come about in the first place. So the Brain and Life article has a follow-on short article about some things that we can do to stay healthy during the time changes. And I'll just go over those, but I have a few comments on a few of them, so let's see what they have to say. The first one, of course, is to establish good sleep habits, because if you don't have those, it doesn't really matter if there's a time change or not, right? What they're saying here is that you need to have regular sleep and wake times. In addition to that, they recommend a bedroom environment that's cool and dark with no electronics. And the no electronics thing, by the way, is a theme that you're going to be hearing a couple of times in these recommendations. Also, a daily routine that has regular exercise, a healthy diet, and limited caffeine. And those are all pretty commonsensical, right? The second one they talk about is shifting your sleep time. And they recommend that you adjust the time that you go to bed. They say 15-minute increments for a series of nights. And I think if that works, that's great. You really do have to plan ahead, though. To do that and to get that full hour, right? You got to be doing it for four nights in a row and not forget and not have anything weird happen to your day. But for me, it was easier just to do it all at once. So what my husband and I do is the Saturday 
of the night that it's going to spring ahead or fall back, we go ahead and just change all the clocks in the late afternoon or the early evening. And then we just go to bed at the time that we would have gone to bed. So if we normally are in bed by, say, 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock, we go to bed when the clock says it's 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, whatever, regardless of what we, our body was used to. And it's amazing how much easier the shift has become for us especially that springing ahead where you lose an hour of sleep. But if you don't get the visual cue from the clock that you have lost that hour, then you don't miss it so much. It's kind of strange, but it works for me. And it might work for you too. They also suggest adjusting your schedule by perhaps moving the times that you eat or the hour that you exercise, revising your evening plans. I think that's sort of similar to what I just described, that you trick your body into thinking that the time change has already happened even before it actually happens. The next one is mind the light, limiting your light exposure late at night, which I think is common sense, and I've read that in many places. But the last thing that they say here, though, the blue light blocking features are helpful for reducing the wavelengths of light with the most effect on circadian rhythms. I don't know that I would necessarily recommend going out and buying one of those sets of glasses or the screen cover, whatever that you can buy that supposedly blocks blue light, because I've heard that not all of those are as advertised. And there are better ways of dealing with blue light, and I'll get to that in a second. And then ask your doctor about sleep supplements as a final thing. You can consider taking half a milligram to one milligram of melatonin 12 hours before your desired wake-up time. For many people, that works really well. I've never found melatonin to be particularly helpful for me, um, but in any case, as they say here, talk to your doctor before you start any supplements. And I think that's excellent advice. Now, in another article that I'll link below, they deal with the question of how does light color help you with sleep? And it all comes down to melatonin production, as they say. They say that red is the answer to the question of what color of light helps you to sleep. Red light causes your brain to produce the sleep hormone melatonin, a hormone released into the body from the pineal gland that helps you mentally and physically relax while you drift off to sleep. So remember, if you remember nothing else, red equals relax. They talk about how the, the body's melatonin levels have been controlled by sunlight traditionally, but in our more modern world, where we rely so much on artificial light, it's kind of screwed up our ability to produce and benefit from melatonin. But as they say down here, researchers say that blue light exposure in the evening can interfere with your body's ability to fall asleep. For this reason, we generally advise you not to expose yourself to blue light sources and stay off your smartphone for at least an hour before bed. And that's what they mentioned earlier in the other article. Electronics generate blue light or give off blue light. And you need to be careful because if you like to check your cell phone or be on your Kindle right before you go to bed, you might find that you have more difficulty falling asleep. And it could well be because the, the blue light exposure it artificially makes you feel like you need to be awake or that you are more awake. So the bottom line is blue is bad. So red is relaxed, blue is bad. That for me works pretty good. I can remember it pretty well that way. Okay, so that's it. That's all I had. I'm interested to know, is any of that even relevant to you? We didn't really mention multiple sclerosis as such, but since MS is so centered in our brain, I'm thinking that anything that affects our brain and how it responds is going to affect our MS. And I have found that some of these ideas were helpful to me 
And as I said, if you remember nothing else, remember that red light is relaxing and blue light is bad. <laughs> so let me know in the comments what you think of all that. Well, until I see you again in my next video, you have a very good day and take really good care of yourself.